thought it must have hit me. I knew immediately I was inside of a shark. Mr. Dago was told to attend someone, which was something you have. I had about 10 seconds to kill that bear, it was going to kill me. I heard a rustle in the bushes, and the next thing I knew I was on the ground. I looked up above and realized I was like 40 feet below and I was going to die. I heard a little bit of grunting and he was snuffing. And it just basically leaned over and started to chew on my head. I saw it going on my son. Literally just, he just had his, his mouth on my son's face, just shaking him. I think the bee must have done me at 2,000 times the court was done it. Unexpectedly, the consequences can be frightening and devastating. In the next hour, we'll examine a number of fascinating real-life stories about animal attacks on human beings. We'll find out why the attacks occurred, what can be done to avoid them, and what you can do if you're attacked. But first, a warning. Much of the footage you'll see this evening was shot by amateur cameramen during actual attacks, and it's quite graphic. We begin in the crystal clear waters of Hawaii with a horrifying encounter with one of Earth's most majestic animals. What you're about to see is an actual home video in which a woman is almost swallowed whole by a whale. Well, it was a beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, Lisa Costello and I were out in my Zodiac. We saw it splashing in the distance. It took us a long time to get up to this splashing and it turned out to be a group of pilot whales that were swimming along very rapidly. Uh, they came over and rode the bow wave of my boat for quite a while. Uh, then we both slowed down together, and the whales milled around my boat for a number of minutes. Very playful right now. They're hanging around it. Lisa uh, wanted to go in the water. Uh, it was a beautiful day. There's no reason why she shouldn't. Uh, and uh, when I got into the water, as soon as I went over the side of the boat, uh, there were two pilot whales swimming uh, right at me. Uh, the whale swam past me and then turned and swam directly toward Lisa. Uh, one of the whales came quite close to Lisa and she swam toward the whale. Uh, there was a lot of eye contact between them and eventually uh, Lisa started to pet the whale. What happened next stunned the swimmer and the photographer. The whale suddenly advanced and grabbed Lisa's thigh. Startled by the sudden action, she pulled free and managed to swim away. But moments later, the pilot whale grabbed Lisa by her ankle and swiftly descended to a depth of 40 feet below the surface. While Dr. Tepley's camera records the scene, Lisa reaches into the whale's mouth and desperately tries to free her ankle. For nearly a minute, she struggles as the whale dives deeper. Desperate for air, she faces brain damage, then death. Finally, the whale brings her to the surface and lets her go. Lisa will never forget the moments of terror. We had eye contact, and then it came around and nipped me in the thigh. And then I thought, what's, what's going on? He just nipped me, what's, what's, what's going on? He came around and grabbed my ankle and started going straight down. And I looked at him like, now what are you doing? And then I suddenly realized I couldn't breathe. I looked up above and realized I was like 40 feet below and I was going to die. Your whole life goes by in microseconds. Thought about who was going to take care of my son. And first I surrendered to death and then I thought, no, I don't want to die. I'm too young to die. After the whale released me, brought me to the surface and, and uh, released me, I was so thankful that I was alive and that I was getting breath into my body. I was just gasping for air and I just felt, I felt so thankful. And, and disbelief too, it's like, oh my God, I lived, I survived. 
when I pulled her into the boat, uh, uh, I, I, I had this great sense of relief that all of, all of her parts were still there. I kind of expected maybe one leg might be missing, or at least, you know, partly mangled or something. Since swimming with whales is strictly prohibited in Hawaii, authorities charged Tepley with harassing the animals. He was convicted and fined $10,000. Later, however, the conviction was reversed by a U.S. District Court, which found that Tepley and Costello had done nothing to intentionally harass the giant sea mammals. Well, I really don't feel like it was an attack. I feel like it was more of, he was curious about me. This, this incident hasn't scared me uh, away from the ocean. Uh, I still dive regularly and I still love the ocean. I think I, I, I'm, more, I'm a lot more cautious now, but um, it, I still love the ocean and love all the creatures in it. And it hasn't uh, deterred me from uh, going diving. What Tepley and Costello will never forget is that in the wild, animals are never predictable, and they must be treated with care and respect. Of all the creatures in the sea, sharks are the scariest predators. Some are even called super predators, and when they attack, they seldom leave survivors. What you're about to see is one of the most amazing animal attack stories ever told, the true story of a man who was swallowed by a great white shark. In August 1993, several friends were preparing to go abalone diving off the northern coast of California. One of the divers, Mike Swartzel, will never forget the day. Well, we decided to take the day off and go diving. It was absolutely a beautiful day. Flat water, about 15 to 20 foot visibility. So we figured it was the perfect day to go diving. We got out about oh, 80 to 100 yards off the shore and we were spread out probably 60 to 80 yards apart. David and I stayed out in front of the bay. We probably dove for a half an hour. David Miles, another one of the divers, was searching the bottom for abalone, but he was not alone. As David headed to the surface for air, he was attacked by a great white shark. The great white swallowed him head first, up to his shoulder blades. Trapped in the jaws of death, he struggled. Then, miraculously, managed to push back and swim free. I was on my way to the surface, uh, looking down, uh, trying to see where I was going to go next on my next dive, see where some abalones might be. And so I was looking down, I was slammed, it felt like a bus that hit me. I knew immediately I was inside of a, a, a shark. When he started closing his mouth, I thought it was over with my eyes. I started wincing, and then I started hearing, uh, I thought it was my, it was my skull was being crushed, and what it was was uh, teeth breaking off, apparently in my head. When he opened his mouth back up again, that was my window of opportunity to escape. Fearing the shark would attack again, David swam frantically to a nearby rock. I kicked the, weight, the weights loose and then I just jettisoned myself. It seemed like on top of this rock by the time I got there. Uh, and I started down uh, yelling to my friends that were in the water. Guys! Guys! Hearing David's desperate cries, his friends swam to safety on another rock. Only Mike was still in the water. When I started hearing a lot of yelling and looked around, I seen the other guys were up on the rocks. My little brother started yelling at me to get out of the water. And that's when I understood that David had got bit. He pulled his coat off and I could see his back was laid open like a fillet knife had been used on him. Bleeding heavily, David's injuries included numerous deep lacerations on his back, scalp and jaw. The gashes in his back were so severe, rescue personnel feared the shark's teeth had punctured David's lung cavity. Over a hundred stitches would be required to close the wounds. I'm gone! Mike Swartzel knew he had to try to save his friend, even if the shark was still in the area. It was about 60 yards from the, the rock to the beach, and what went through my mind was, uh, Tara did not want to get back in the water again. I, I know the shark was in there, and I was bleeding, and from what I hear, uh, sharks can smell blood, 
a long way away. I finally told him, you have to get in the water now. We have to get out of here. He did jump into the water then and got on my tube, his chest. Uh, I grabbed the front of the tube and took off swimming for shore. David was swimming behind me with his chest on the tube. Jeff Landisman is an expert on why sharks attack. Uh, white sharks, for instance, uh, it's, it's felt that they attack humans uh, because it's a case of mistaken identity. It's thought that a great white shark looking upwards would see this silhouette that, that they think might be their prey. And then they would rush from below and attack. I was worried about him maybe bleeding to death. I did start getting worried because he started getting lethargic. The shock was kind of setting in on him. When Mike and David finally reached the shore, they were met by the other divers who had already summoned emergency assistance. I feel as though I won the lottery that day. Uh, they tell me it's like 300 million to one uh, to survive a, a great white attack and being head first in a great white attack, I don't know what the odds are, but uh, I felt as though I won the lottery that day. Uh, uh, felt very lucky. Coming up, a brown bear suddenly attacks an innocent guest on a TV show. And a circus turns to tragedy when an elephant goes on a deadly rampage. On when animals attack. When animals attack, sometimes it's part of a cultural tradition. As you're about to see, each year in Pamplona, Spain, during the legendary running of the bulls, participants actually relish the thrill and excitement of tangling with the raging animals. The bulls give the runners what they come for, an adrenaline rush that comes with being so close to the dangerous and unpredictable creatures. But watch what happens when one runner makes the critical mistake of turning his back on the bull. Speared through his upper thigh, Torley Orban desperately wrestles for his life. As paramedics administer first aid, he remains conscious, though obviously in pain, with serious injuries that will take months to heal. In Pamplona, men and women knowingly tempt their fate with animals. But sometimes animals attack when we unknowingly invade their territory. In this next story, we learn how an innocent family picnic in the wrong place, at the wrong time, led to tragedy. More and more families are using outdoor recreation areas, areas that are home to wild animals, such as the mountain lion. As we encroach on their habitat, we can easily become their prey. That's exactly what happened in 1990, when Scott O'Hare, then nine years old, was picnicking with his family in Montana's Glacier National Park. We had finished getting ready for lunch and everything. Our table was all set. And we sent my daughter down to get the two boys, tell them to come up. Go get your brother, tell him it's time for lunch. And she went down to the lake, and the four adults were there at the picnic table. What no one realized was that the children were being stalked by a mountain lion. Dad said it was time for lunch, come on. As the boys raced back to the picnic area, Scott lagged behind. I heard a cry for help. It was Chad, and first cry didn't pay a lot of attention because they were probably goofing around and whatnot. Uh, then it was followed by a second cry for help, and I heard urgency in that call. The adults ran to see what was the matter. I heard a rustle in the bushes, and... Um, the mountain lion made a growl. The next thing I knew I was on the ground. The mountain lion placed its jaws on my head, which is basically ripping the skin. It was frightening because I knew that something was on top of me and scratching and biting at me. Now when I got there and saw that what was happening, that the mountain lion had Scott's arm in his mouth, 
Uh, I kept running towards her because I wanted to get the mountain lion off of him. <laughs> Michael saw the animal and he kicked some sand into the cat's face. And at the and that caused the cat to release his hold on the Scott and it took off. Don't move. Stick it easy, boy. Take it My wife swooped in and picked him up. And uh she picked him up and carried him and uh she was, you know, a little panic stricken herself. She was screaming, oh my God. Scott was rushed to the hospital in Kalispell, Montana, where he underwent surgery to mend the injuries to his head, back, and arms. A deep gash across his face would leave him legally blind in his left eye. Within hours, an animal tracker located the mountain lion and killed it, less than a hundred yards from where the attack took place. Michael D. is an expert on mountain lion behavior. Just running, that is a, a, a signal to set the cat off that, oh, look at this, something to run after. And then a pow, and cougar jumps on him. In and around wilderness areas, mountain lions can be very dangerous. Children are especially vulnerable and should stay close to their parents at all times when camping or hiking. A mountain lion can weigh up to 150 pounds. And you take an animal that size going after a human, let's say uh, 30 or 40 pounds, that's no match. He's lucky to be alive, okay? I, we're thankful to God that uh, he reacted the way he did. We've all heard horror stories about killer bees. Killer bees or Africanized bees are so aggressive they've been known to attack and kill cattle as well as people. In their fury, they will violently defend an area up to a quarter mile from their nest or hive. One unfortunate family in Texas experienced the terror of a killer bee attack firsthand. In September 1994, 86-year-old J.C. Johnson Sr., a retired minister, set out to mow his neighbor's lawn, something he did as a favor when she was out of town. When he pushed his mower past a wooden shed between the two properties, the noise and vibrations from the motor stirred up a nest of Africanized killer bees. I went over next door in the backyard to mow the grass. And just as I was even with that barn type building there, I was suddenly surrounded by bees. They were just so surrounded my head. And I ran over to a hydrant that had a hose on it. And I turned on the water and tried washing bees off, but didn't make a dent in it. They just covered me. And I said, well, I better get out of here. And so I ran out the gate and on out to where I saw another hydrant with holes on it. And so I tried that water and no good. And it was so thick with bees, it sounded like a cloud. Meanwhile, his son, J.C. Johnson Jr., who lives next door, noticed an unusual number of bees in his yard. He had just gone inside to escape the bees when he heard a cry for help. Help! Okay, I saw my father across the street lying down, and I was concerned about him because I thought perhaps he'd had a heart attack or he had fallen. And so I called to him. I said, Dad, are you all right? And he said, no. So immediately I raced across the street to find out what the situation was. And that's where I discovered the bees. And the bees were all over him, all over his face, all over everywhere, and quickly were all over me. And it's a, a very uncomfortable and panic-causing type situation. And you didn't feel any one bee. You just felt the whole thing is like it. You were in a furnace. I was never afraid that I was going to die. I was concerned for my father's safety and health because he's elderly. While J.C. Jr.'s wife called 911, the killer beast relentlessly attacked the two men. Police officer Diana Fox. When we arrived on the scene, all we knew was man down. And when I turned the corner, it looked like it was just a black blob. It, he was completely covered with bees. They came right in there uh, with complete disregard for their own safety. None of my training had 
prepared me for this. So I just went over and started using my hands to get him out of his face and to see if he was still alive. As the bees attacked her too, Officer Fox used a fire extinguisher to try to stop them. Both of the Johnsons were transported to a local hospital for emergency treatment to try to counteract the bee venom. I think the bees must have stung me in the neighborhood uh, that 2,000 times according to some estimates. But I, nobody counted and so the bees won the day. Dr. Norman Gary is a bee expert. Africanized bees are different from ordinary honeybees. They are honeybees. They're different species. But the important thing to know is that they defend their nest very, very aggressively. If you find that you're being attacked by bees, killer or otherwise, uh, the best thing to do is to flee the area. Get out of the defensive zone because they really do sting near the hive. You keep going until you lose them or until you can get inside of a house or uh, a car or something like that. A polar bear mauls a visitor in a dangerously close encounter at the zoo. Plus, a brown bear attacks a TV show guest. Next, on When Animals Attack. In the wild or in captivity, bears are among the most unpredictable of all animals and are responsible for some of the most horrifying attacks on people. What causes bears to attack isn't always clear, but we do know they are driven by enormous appetites and at times do not fear humans. Experts believe the smell of food, smoke from a campfire, even fragrant colognes and deodorants can attract bears and cause them to attack. Polar bears are not only aggressive, but also capable of killing their prey instantly. This woman was attacked when she scaled the fence at a zoo to have her picture taken with the predator. Even trained bears that are accustomed to being around humans can attack suddenly and swiftly, as this footage from a Polish TV program dramatically demonstrates. When this man got too close to a panda bear, he could have lost more than his jacket. He could have lost his life. Anyone who goes fishing, hiking, or camping in a wilderness area should be on the lookout for bears. When we venture into their territory, especially if we set up camp, we are practically inviting bears to visit. Next, a camper's nightmare when he's almost killed by a bear on the prowl. In August 1993, 12-year-old Bobby Clark was attending Boy Scout camp in Southern California. At 5 a.m. while the scouts were sleeping, two black bears wandered into the campsite. Scoutmaster Mike O'Neill and the other counselors tried to shoo the bears away. One. The bears retreated into the darkness, but moments later, one of them returned to the area where Bobby Clark and two other scouts were sleeping. Even though the scouts had taken special precautions to put away their food for the night, experts believe bears can be attracted by the smell of smoke from a campfire or the lingering scent of food on campers themselves. Now the only thing between the sleeping scouts and the marauding bear was a rustic lean-to shelter the boys had constructed to earn a merit badge. As the bear attacked, the other two scouts were able to flee, but it was too late for Bobby Clark. Oh. 
cries for help brought Scoutmaster Mike O'Neill to the scene. Hey, hey, get out of here! Come on! I heard one of my assistant Scoutmasters holler for me to come over to a lean-to, and he yelled that, my God, the bears got him. Well, when I first looked into the lean-to, I just saw one of my scouts underneath the bear, a portion of the scout's head in his mouth. Everything at that point seemed slow motion. Finally, the bear retreated, but only after tearing off a four by five inch piece of Bobby's scalp. He was rushed to Redlands Community Hospital, where he underwent three hours of surgery. Later, more surgeries would be required to graft skin to the injured area. I was working on a, on a merit badge that I was getting and we had to build a shelter out like away from camp and sleep in it for one night. And so we had this lean-to type shelter built out of logs and stuff and I was sleeping in that with two other scouts. I woke up when I felt the bear basically like sit on me. I heard a little bit of grunting and you know snuffing and it just basically leaned over and started to chew on my head. It feels like nails against the chalkboard kind of inside of your head. Um, so it's just a grinding sensation. And no, there was there was no pain though. It, I was in shock, I don't know why. I was, I was conscious the whole time and coherent, but there was no pain. We'll get him to the truck. Bear expert Glenn Stewart believes the bear was after food, not Bobby Clark. Most of the attacks on human beings by black bears have been cases where the bear is searching for food. Uh, he smells food in a tent or in a person's sleeping bag. He follows his nose to the food scent and he takes a bite of what he thinks is going to be food. Bears are like wild animals and that's that's what they do is they, they you know hunt for food. And so it's, if they attack you, it's kind of your own problem. You have to have to understand that they're not like pets and they're, they're strong animals and they can do some damage. Montana wildlife officer Lou Kiss almost lost his life trying to help a bear. Kiss was attempting to relocate a problem grizzly that otherwise would have to be killed. As he released the bear in its new home, Kiss realized the grizzly was not as tranquilized as it should have been. The bear grabbed the cage and pulled Kiss and the cage off the back of the truck. As I fell through the air, uh, I had a split-second fleeting thought, Lou, you're in trouble. And I landed on top of the bear, and I had a, a flash of tremendous heat on me. This bear felt like he uh, was 200 degrees, and of course, I bounced off the bear onto the ground. As these amazing photos show, Kiss is fighting for his life with a grizzly. So the thought went through my mind that I had about 10 seconds to kill that bear, it was going to kill me. Kiss draws his gun and begins firing. The, the vulnerable spot is right here in the throat, you know, that axis joint. And I can't say that I thought that, but the instant he raised his head up, I shot him there. Lou Kiss killed the grizzly with his sixth and final bullet. The ranger was hospitalized later with severe injuries. And I, uh, I have no regrets doing what I did to him, but uh, as far as grizzly bear are concerned, I like them and, and they're a beautiful animal. Lucas retired after he killed that grizzly. He spends most of his time these days fishing. A trained pit bull is used to commit a vicious murder. And a circus elephant gone wild turns on its trainer. next on When Animals Attack. Dogs have certainly earned their reputation as man's best friend, and the vast majority of dogs are wonderful, loving pets and companions. However, due to the inbreeding and cruel training of certain breeds, dogs can be both unpredictable and vicious. 
Which brings us to the story of a Southern California couple on a Sunday outing with their 18-month-old child. Their encounter with a neighborhood dog, in this case, an Akita Chow mix, would change their lives forever. Alan Roberts, Stacy Morton, and their son Andrew had stopped at a local coffee shop. Stacy waited outside with Andrew. She noticed the Akita and assumed it belonged to one of the patrons. Andrew was about two feet away from me. He was just doing his little 18-month-old thing, and I, you know, I was watching him, and I watched the dog walk past him, and he had, I, you know, I acknowledged the dog, you know, by saying dog, and, you know, I said back to him, yes, doggy. I, I walked out of the coffee shop, and I heard Stacy scream, oh, my God, oh, my God, and I looked to my left, and I saw the dog on my son. His front paws came up into the air, and he did a full spin, and uh, came straight down onto Andrews, pushed him down by his shoulders and went straight for his face. I saw the dog on my son, literally just, he just had his, his mouth on my son's face, just shaking him. And I could see Andy just, you know, moving to the left, to the right. Stacy managed to scare the Akita away. The couple immediately headed for the nearest emergency room. I thought that, that the dog had taken his eye out, his left eye, because there was, a, there was a really long laceration that started above his eye and went all the way down his nose. At the hospital, doctors had good news. Andy's eye had not been damaged, but more than 60 stitches would be required to repair injuries to his nose and forehead. While Stacy and Andrew waited for the surgeon, Alan returned to the scene of the attack. I decided that I was going to go and see if I could find the dog and, and the owner of the dog and try and figure out exactly what had happened. And, uh, so um, I left the hospital. Armed with a baseball bat, Alan set out to locate the dog he found its owner, April Wilde, standing outside in her yard. The Akita was chained to a fence. What happened next would make this a landmark animal attack case. He had a bat in his hand and I just said, please don't hurt my dog. She walked over and untied the dog and the dog started to approach me. And as soon as it got within striking distance, um, uh, I hit it with the bat. And I continued to hit it until I was convinced that it was dead. Then I turned around and I walked back to my truck and I went back to the hospital and, and sat through the surgery. Roberts was charged with animal cruelty. The trial over the vengeful murder divided the community into two camps, those who sided with the father and those sympathetic with the Akita. Animal advocate Eileen Pinder was called by the dog owner immediately after the beating. I was really angry at the message it sent to the public because, again, I felt like it was open season on dogs. I felt like anybody, if they got angry enough, if a dog snapped or if a dog did something wrong, it was okay for them to brutally beat that animal. Kevin Ryan is an expert on dog behavior. In the case of the Akita attack, we see something we see in virtually every dog bite situation. A dog was kept on a chain. In a situation where a dog is kept on a chain, the dog becomes very, very aggressive due to the frustrated nature of being at the end of that chain. When the dog finally got free, he goes on a rampage looking for the most helpless creature he can find. In this case, it was a child. The trial focused on the emotionally charged question. Was Alan Roberts justified in brutally killing the dog that viciously attacked his son? After hearing all of the evidence, the jury rendered its verdict. We, the jury, in the above entitled case, find the defendant, Alan Edward Roberts, not guilty. Even though Alan Roberts was acquitted and his son Andrew is expected to recover completely, there are no winners in this dramatic case. Just scars that must heal with time. Well, you know, we have a dead dog and we have a son who's sustained injuries that, that, that are going to affect him for years to come. And they're just wasn't anything about it that made me feel good. We turn now to a different kind of dog and a very different kind of attack. This is a disturbing, chilling, and true story about a trained pit bull used as a murder weapon when it was ordered to savagely attack and kill one of its owners. Cleveland detective Mikey Taliano knew something wasn't right when she entered the home where Angela Kaplan was found dead. But when we arrived at the scene, we observed that there was no blood in the, on the front steps and the doorway. There was no blood in the, on the side door. And her body was laying on the couch. She was draped in a sheet. 
When we walked into the bedroom, it was, uh, I was stunned when I saw this because it, it, there was blood on the ceiling, on the walls. The bed clothing was soaked with blood. It appeared that someone had bled out in that room. And it was obvious that this was the crime scene and the body had been moved. Moments later, police discovered a pit bull named Mac locked in an upstairs closet. The dog belonged to the victim's common-law husband, Jeffrey Mann. The dog was immediately taken into custody, and Mann became the prime suspect. We went back to the office and interviewed the defendant, and at that time he gave us about three or four different stories about what had happened. The first one, of course, her going for a walk. Then he said he was sleeping. She came home, playfully jumped in bed, frightened the dog. The dog attacked her, but he had taken some medication, and he fell asleep, and when he woke up, he found her dead. And then he told me that another dog broke in the house and attacked her, not his dog. An autopsy would reveal that Angela Kaplan bled to death from nearly 300 puncture wounds in an attack that was so vicious, teeth marks could be seen on the bone. Later that night, the vet who had examined Mac called Taliano to tell her the dog didn't seem very aggressive, but suspiciously Mac had been recently washed. Could Mac be a trained attack dog? When I suspected that the dog was used as a weapon, I knew I had a homicide investigation on my hands. I knew that that's how it would have to be investigated. This was not a dog that went berserk and attacked someone. This was a dog that was told to attack someone, which resulted in the death. To prove that Mac had been trained by Jeffrey Mann to attack on command, Taliano called in training expert Benjamin McPeak. I asked the dog warden to take the dog outside so I could test the dog to see what kind of reactions I would get. And uh, the dog was very social. I walked up, I petted it. Uh, there was no signs of fear or stress in the dog. But when McPeak showed Mac one of the sleeves used to train pit bulls to attack, Mac became a different dog. The minute the dog saw the attack sleeve, he became very aggressive. He came to the end of the chain. He's jumping up, he's barking, he's biting at the sleeve. So there was no doubt in my mind that he had been trained to do attack work because he knew what a sleeve was. Forensic experts determined that Mac's teeth matched the bite pattern on the victim's bones. The coroner ruled Angela Kaplan's death a homicide, and investigators sought to prove that Jeffrey Mann had used Mac as the murder weapon. After a three and a half week trial, Mann was convicted of murder. He was sentenced to 15 years to life and is known in jail as dog man. Because experts never learned the command used to make him attack, Mac had to be destroyed. He too became a victim in this chilling case. The horror of an elephant's deadly rampage, up next on When Animals Attack. Our final story is in a word disturbing. It proves that even trained animals can sometimes turn on their trainers and cause deadly harm. In this case, a circus elephant goes on a rampage, killing one person and seriously injuring 15 others. Again, a word of caution. The footage you're about to see is alarming, and we remind you, viewer discretion is advised. Elephants are among the world's largest and most fascinating animals. In captivity, they also can be notoriously dangerous. There are 600 elephants in captivity throughout the world. In the U.S., elephants kill at least one of their handlers each year, making elephant handling the most hazardous profession in the nation. One such attack occurred on August 20th, 1994, at Circus International in Honolulu, Hawaii. Without warning, an agitated African elephant named Tyke suddenly went on a rampage. Miraculously, Tyke's groom, the man in gray, would survive the attack. But when Tyke's trainer, Alan Campbell, the man in blue, attempted to gain control of the 2,000-pound elephant, Tyke turned her rage on him, too. Steve Horano, a PR representative for the circus, was there. When I ran into the arena, I saw that uh, the trainer, Alan Campbell, was trying to 
calm an elephant down. There was a lot of uh, noise and pandemonium. Authorities would later learn that this was Tyke's third rampage in a year. Gail Shalesky and her family were in the audience. And then there was the elephant underneath the man on the high wire, and it looked like he had a big rag doll tied to his, tied to her front leg that she was shaking around the way the man's head was moving. It looked like a rag doll. And then people started panicking because slowly the people closest to the elephant realized that this was not part of the show and something was wrong. Tyke instinctively tried to go back with, even though her tusk had been removed. The raging elephant headed for the nearest exit, but her deadly charge had already sent a wave of panic through the crowd. It was frightening. It was terrifying to have this elephant loose with nobody to control it. There was nobody outside to control the elephant. There were just scared parents and children. I saw other kids falling down, but the elephant was right behind us, so we couldn't help her or anything. But I was really terrified. My daughter said that she was close enough to touch Tyke as she ran by. And then Tyke took out the doors. She must have hit him head on and threw one of them at least 20 feet. With amazing speed, Tyke stormed out of the arena into the parking lot. Hirano followed, trying to stay ahead of the pandemonium. And at that point in time, the elephant had passed me. I was still going around in a circle and I felt I had time to close the gate which I did, and I felt that it was important that I uh, chain it. Hirano managed to close the gate, but it did no good. He too was trampled and suffered multiple fractures. Moments later, Honolulu police arrived on the scene and were forced to gun down the elephant. If the police hadn't fired when they did, I would not be alive talking to you today. And I guess they thought my life was in danger, so that's the point in time in which they fired. Animal activist Chris DeRose believes the incident was understandable. Tyke struck out because of years of frustration, years of stress, years of being dominated, years of not being in its natural habitat doing what it would normally do. Trainer Alan Campbell died later from the massive injuries he received during the attack. In addition to Beckwith and Hirano, 13 other people were hospitalized with injuries from the rampage. It's a tragedy in the sense that the animal had to be killed, Alan Campbell had to be killed, and that a lot of people had to see something like this happen. The buildup starts when they bring these animals in from their natural habitat in Africa, and um, Tyke is a, an African elephant, and uh, it's the shipping over, the breaking up of the family, um, and then it's the, the domination over them, the training to break their spirit. That's the only way you can get these animals to do something as silly as standing on their head or wearing costumes or walking around in a circle. When animals attack, there is always a lesson to be learned. When we invade an animal's natural habitat, endanger its young, or threaten its food supply, we are at risk. As we've seen tonight, the best way to avoid such attacks is to respect animals and their natural environment. In the end, we must all protect and share this earth together. I'm Robert Urich. Good night, and thanks for watching. May is the month, and Fox is the place for non-stop entertainment. Yeah! With blockbuster features like Adam's Family Values. Why are you just like somebody died? Wait. What's love got to do with it? And the Mother's Day premiere Hello! of Mrs. Doubtfire. My first day as a woman getting hot flashes. Fox original movies you can't see anywhere else, plus the season finales of all your favorite shows. Woohoo! May is the month. Fox is the place.